1. Learning to let go. Two poor woodcutters were gathering wood in the mountains. One day they found two bags of silk cotton and happily carried them home. Since cotton sold for much more than wood, selling those two bags could feed their family for a month. As they descended the mountain, each carrying a bag, one of them saw a large bundle of cloth on the road. On closer inspection, it was a type of coarse cloth, slightly larger than a bundle. He was excited and suggested to his friend that they swap their cotton bags for the cloth. His friend disagreed, arguing that they had already carried the cotton a long way, and abandoning it now would waste all their previous effort. He refused to switch. Unable to persuade his friend, the first woodcutter took the cloth and continued on his own. Further down the road, the man carrying the cloth saw a glimmer in the forest. Approaching, he discovered many precious metals and gems, thinking this was their big break. He urged his friend to drop the cotton bag and carry the treasure instead. However, his friend remained skeptical, suspecting the treasure might be fake, and advised against wasting effort to end up empty-handed. The one who found the treasure had to carry it alone. As they reached the foot of the mountain, a heavy rain soaked them completely. Worse still, the cotton bag on the woodcutter's back absorbed water, becoming too heavy to carry, forcing him to abandon it and join his friend carrying the treasure home, empty-handed. 2. Nature a wealthy man's daughter fell deeply in love with a poor young man. Her father told her to bring her boyfriend home to meet the family. Excited, she shared the good news with the young man. However, he was saddened by this, as his family was very poor, and he didn't even have a decent set of clothes. Eventually, the wealthy man's daughter had to prepare everything for him. On the appointed day, the young man happily went to his girlfriend's house. Seeing his dignified and handsome demeanor, the wealthy man was very pleased. However, he frowned soon after because, despite the expensive clothes, they didn't smell fragrant. Realizing the young man couldn't afford such attire, the wealthy man felt sad. While the daughter and her mother went to wash their hands, the wealthy man asked the young man, These clothes aren't yours, are they? The young man's face turned red, but he nodded. The wealthy man said, We know your family situation, and I understand you did this to make us happy and to not embarrass us. However, it's unfortunate that you're not only disguising your appearance but denying your true self. We aren't afraid of your poverty. We're most concerned about honesty. If someone denies their true self, how can they stand firm in society? How can I be at peace giving my daughter to you? The wealthy man's blunt words were like a cold splash of water, deeply embarrassing the young man. This introduction was also a valuable lesson for him. From then on, he abandoned vanity and always stayed true to himself. After the wealthy couple passed away, he and his wife inherited their entire fortune, which they donated to society by building schools and engaging in public work. Later, they became even wealthier than his wife's parents, but lived very modestly, always remembering that true happiness comes from being honest with oneself and what one has. 3. The Village Shrine At the entrance of the village, there's a small shrine that houses a wooden statue of a deity. It has been a long time since anyone has worshipped there and the shrine is covered in a thick layer of dust. One day, a man passing by the shrine encountered a large ditch blocking his path and couldn't continue. He blamed the deity for placing the ditch in his way, overturned the altar, and threw the deity's statue into the ditch. Another person, seeing this and feeling compassion, picked up the statue, cleaned it off, and respectfully placed it back on the altar. However, the deity reprimanded him for not offering incense and punished him with a headache that lasted for half a month. A local official, puzzled, asked, Why is it that the man who threw you into the ditch suffered no consequences, yet the one who helped you is punished? The deity replied, You don't understand, it's always the gentle ones who are easiest to bully. 
4. Beauty and Ugliness A teacher went on a trip with his students, and when night fell, they stopped at a roadside inn to rest. The innkeeper had two wives. One was very beautiful and the other quite plain. This sparked a debate among the students about whom the innkeeper loved more. Some thought he surely loved the beautiful wife, while others believed he loved neither. Eventually, they went to ask the innkeeper himself. He said, I love the plain wife and dislike the beautiful one. Everyone was surprised and couldn't understand why he loved the plain wife and disliked the beautiful one. They decided to ask the innkeeper about it, but the teacher stopped them, explaining, because the innkeeper loves true beauty. The beautiful wife always dresses up and acts superior, which makes her ugly inside. The plain wife, although not physically attractive, has inner beauty. Tell me, which is more important, maintaining a beautiful appearance or having a beautiful spirit? The beautiful wife's arrogance has made her unpleasant, while the humility of the plain wife is what truly makes her beautiful. 5. The Optimistic Blind Men Two blind men were walking down the street using their canes. One of them said, Being blind is actually not bad. People who can see are always busy, working non-stop. Farmers have it even tougher, unlike us who can relax and be at ease. The other blind man agreed. You're right. Farmers really have a hard life. Just then, a few farmers walked by and overheard the conversation. One of them pretended to be an official and said, You too, when you see the official coming, why don't you move out of the way? Do you want to die? Another farmer then hit each of the blind men on the head with a stick, pushing them to the side of the road. Afterward, they quietly moved behind them to eavesdrop on their conversation. One of the blind men then remarked, In the end, being blind is still best. If we had been able to see and not moved out of the way for the official, we would have been beaten and then thrown in jail. The other blind man added, Exactly, we just got hit a few times. We are still the luckiest ones. 6. Two Travelers and the Axe Two people were walking down a road together when one of them found an axe. He exclaimed, Look what I found. The other corrected him, saying, You mean, we found. Later, the person who lost the axe came along and accused the one holding the axe of stealing it. The accused then said to his companion, Now we're in trouble. But his companion replied, No, it's, I'm in trouble, not we. This story shows that if someone isn't willing to share their gains, they shouldn't expect others to share their troubles. 7. Don't be too trusting Long ago, there was a nomad who used to lead his flock of goats to the plains every day and happily watch them graze. One evening, a thief sneaked in to steal some goats, but upon seeing that the nomad stayed awake all night, always alert and protecting his flock, the thief felt discouraged and ended up just talking to him through the night, not daring to steal anything. However, the cunning thief came up with a plan. He killed a tiger and skinned it, placing the skin in the grass with only the tiger's head visible. After setting this up, he approached the nomad and said, My friend, you are lucky. The tiger sent me to ask for a goat for its dinner. The nomad, suspicious, asked, where is this tiger? He looked towards where the thief pointed and indeed saw the tiger's head peeking out from the grass in the distance, which startled him. He told the thief, My friend, take whichever goat you need. I won't stop you. So the thief took a goat away. Seeing that the nomad was frightened by the sight of the tiger, the thief's greed grew. He kept coming back, claiming each time that the tiger wanted to eat. Eventually, the thief managed to take half of the nomad's goats this way. 8. Keep your distance Long ago, there was a hunter who, whenever he caught a wild animal, would skin it and discard the meat. One day, a male lion came into the area and found the fresh meat. The lion began to regularly eat the meat left by the hunter. 
Over time, the lion and the hunter grew familiar with each other. One day, the hunter approached the lion, put his hand on its shoulder, and the lion wagged its tail as if they were friends. Thinking the lion was tame and had become his hunting pet, the hunter decided to try riding the lion like his other hunting animals and even thought about skinning it. Emboldened by this thought, the hunter jumped on the lion's back to start skinning it. Angered by this, the lion quickly turned on him, knocking him to the ground and fatally mauling him with its claws. 9. The Origin of Strength In a small town, there was a very poor boy who wandered the streets daily to beg for food. Despite his hardships, he possessed extraordinary strength. Whenever the king's elephant walked through the village, the boy could stop it just by holding its tail. He also used to sit on the elephant, amusing everyone in town who would gather to watch and laugh. This greatly embarrassed and angered the king. The king summoned his advisor and said, we must find a way to deal with this boy. It's humiliating. I dread passing through that town, but we can't just send him away. Wherever he is, he can grab my elephant's tail and stop it. That boy is too strong. I want to take his strength away. The advisor replied, He's just a beggar. If he had a shop, it would consume his energy. If he were a schoolboy, he'd lose his vigor too. But he has nothing else to do and spends his days playing while everyone loves him and feeds him. Therefore, he only eats and sleeps, wakes up and plays. He's always happy and carefree, so it's hard to take his strength away. One day, a wise man suggested to the king, find a job for the boy. Tell him if he agrees to work, even a small job, he'll earn a gold rupee each day. The job is to light lamps at the village temple every evening at dusk. Someone must give him a gold rupee daily for this. Another advisor questioned, But what's the use? It'll only make him stronger. If he earns a rupee, he'll eat more and he won't need to beg anymore. The wise man said, Just do as I say. So the begging boy started lighting lamps at the temple daily. By the second week, when the king passed through the town again, the boy tried to grab the elephant's tail but failed and was dragged along by the elephant. 10. The Carts of the State of So The State of So originally had no carts, and the people of So did not know how to make them. Therefore, many of them wanted to learn this skill. Having a good cart for transportation during wars would be very helpful for their military. One person from So visited the state of Tan and by chance saw a broken cart abandoned on the outskirts of the city. The cart's frame, wheels, and axles were all damaged and beyond repair. Even though this cart was in ruins, having seen carts in Tan, he was certain it was indeed a cart. However, this person did not examine the cart carefully and eager to make a significant contribution back home, decided to take the broken cart with him to So. Upon returning, he boasted, Come see the cart at my house. I just made one, and it was not easy at all. This drew a large crowd to his house, as if attending a festival, and seeing the cart inside, they all believed his exaggerated claims. They debated among themselves. So, this is what a cart looks like. It seems useless. Maybe it's broken. Yes, I think so too. Inspired by this broken model, the people of So started making their carts. Later, when people from Tan saw the carts from So, they fell over laughing and mocked them, saying, The people of So only know how to make broken carts, but what good are broken carts? However, the people of So ignored the mockery and continued making their flawed carts. Eventually, when war broke out and they were surrounded by enemies, the people of So were confident because they had carts and could still manage to fight. In the end, when they pushed their faulty carts onto the battlefield, they were completely defeated. 11. The Chick and the Corn Kernels There was a little chick that often sat anxiously in its nest. One day, Someone suddenly appeared outside, startling the chick into running away. When it returned, the person was gone, 
but there were corn kernels in front of the nest. The chick was puzzled and thought to itself, where did these corn kernels come from? The next day, the same person came again, and the chick ran away once more. Upon returning, the person was gone, but the corn kernels were still there. The chick began to suspect a connection between the person and the corn. However, it was too early to draw any conclusion, so it continued to wait and watch. The chick kept waiting and observing, day after day. Eventually, it formed a theory. Every time this person appears, the corn appears too. It observed this 999 times. Now, it was certain that when the person appeared, the corn would also appear. This person was the cause, and the corn was the effect. After 999 times, the chick was confident in this inevitable relationship because it had waited, tested, observed, and researched many times. It believed this pattern would continue without exception. The chick was excited to see the person appear for the 1,000th time. When the person did appear, the chick approached them, thankful for their kindness, but ultimately, it was killed. Life is like that. There is no guaranteed cause and effect. Even if something happens 999 times, you cannot conclude that the 1,000th time won't be an exception. 12. The Value of a Stone There was a wise teacher who grew tired of his student asking him every day, what is the value of a person? One day, the teacher handed the student a stone and instructed, take this stone to the market, but do not sell it. Just see how much people are willing to pay for it. Following the teacher's advice, the student took the stone to the market. One person thought the stone was big and beautiful and offered two dollars for it, while another, thinking it could be carved into a pendant, offered ten dollars. Others considered using it for home decoration or as a gift for a child. Each person had a different purpose, but the highest bid was only ten dollars. The student reported this back to the teacher. The next day, the teacher said, Now, Take it to a place where they sell gold and ask them how much they would pay, but remember, do not sell it. At the gold market, people offered significantly higher amounts. One person offered a large sum right away, another offered thousands of dollars, and yet another offered tens of thousands, even going above a hundred thousand dollars. The student was astounded but did not sell the stone. The following day, the teacher instructed the student to take the stone to a precious gem market, but again cautioned him only to inquire about the price. There, the offer started at tens of thousands of dollars, rising to $20,000 and even as high as $100,000, but the student held firm and did not sell. When he returned and gave the stone back to his teacher, the teacher finally explained, We never intended to sell it, but now you understand, right? If you only ask without thinking, your value is only what those at the market see. The true value of a person lies within, in their heart, and to see this true value, one must first have a noble perspective. Our value is not for others to comment on from the outside, but lies within each of us, in our own determination, our personal growth, and our resilience. Every person can become invaluable, and even when life is tough and we face setbacks, there is inherent value if we know how to overcome them. 13. The Wolves Escape from the Den A pack of wolves was chased by a hunter and took refuge in their den. The hunter set a trap at the entrance so the first wolf to leave would be caught. However, the rest of the wolves would be saved. The pack was trapped inside, starving for a day and a night, and they discussed who should go out first. The oldest wolf said, I'm the oldest here. It doesn't make sense for me to go first. The youngest wolf said, I'm the youngest. It's not fair for me to go out first. The mother wolf said, I have three babies waiting to be fed. Can you bear to see them starve to death? A limping wolf said, I'm already injured. I need to be taken care of. Only one healthy wolf remained who said, I could go out first. 
but if I go out last, I could attack the hunter and avenge you all. A few days later, the hunter pulled a pack of starved wolves from the den. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. 14. The most important thing. A king wished for his people to always live in peace and believe that the prosperity of his nation depended on three key things, knowing the most critical time, recognizing the most important person, and understanding the most vital action. His advisors suggested mastering the timing, organizing schedules, and focusing on nurturing clerics and scientists while promoting science and enforcing strict laws. Seeking further wisdom, the king visited a hermit who did not respond to his questions. Instead, the hermit, who was exhausted from digging, was helped by the king. As dusk fell, a wounded man sought the hermit's help, and the king assisted him with his injuries. The next day, this man, who was initially an enemy planning to kill the king, thanked him for saving his life and declared his enmity over, wishing to become friends. When the king again asked the hermit to solve the three problems, the hermit revealed that the answers had already been given through these actions. The hermit explained that if the king hadn't compassionately helped him, he would have been delayed and likely killed by his enemy. And by caring for his injured foe, the king turned an enemy into a friend. Therefore, the most critical time is always the present, the most important person is the one beside you, and the most vital action in the world is to love, for without love, life lacks meaning. 15. Miracles are still waiting for you. Two seeds of the same type were planted in the same piece of land. One seed thought, this soil is rich, I must sprout and keep growing. I want to experience all the seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, and see many beautiful scenes. So, it kept growing relentlessly. By the following fall, it had become a large tree with lush branches and leaves. The other seed thought, if I grow roots here, I might hit hard rocks below, which could hurt my delicate nerves. If I sprout, snails might eat me. If I blossom and bear fruit, kids might come and pick them. Maybe it's just easier and safer to stay here, underground. So, it stayed hidden in the soil. One day, a chicken came along, searching for food, found the seed, pecked at it a few times, and then swallowed it. 16. Superstitious Fear in a certain county, a junior officer went to pay his respects to the district officer who offered him a glass of wine. As the junior officer was about to drink, he noticed a small pink snake swimming in the glass. Since it was a gift from a superior, he closed his eyes and drank it anyway. When he got home, he suffered severe stomach pains and couldn't eat. Eventually, he became seriously ill and grew weaker each day. His family called many doctors and tried various treatments, but none worked. Later, the district officer visited the junior officer at his home, saw how ill he was, and asked what had happened. The junior officer explained that he had swallowed a small pink snake from the wine glass the officer had given him. The district officer was skeptical, but the junior officer insisted it was true. Back at his office, the district officer kept thinking about the story. Looking up, he noticed a red bow hanging on the north wall and suddenly understood what had happened. He had the sick officer brought to his office, showed him the glass of wine under the red bow, and a red snake appeared in the glass. The district officer explained that it was just a reflection of the bow on the wall. Relieved to learn he hadn't actually swallowed a snake, the junior officer quickly recovered within a few days. 17. The Enchanted Salted Fish Once a hunter caught a deer and tied it to a tree while he continued hunting. During his absence, a merchant passed by and, tempted to take the deer, 
felt guilty about stealing. Instead, he hung a salted fish on the tree as a trade for the deer. When the hunter returned and found the salted fish instead of his deer, he was astonished. Believing this to be a miraculous transformation, he thought the fish must be magical. Word of the enchanted fish spread quickly, and people began flocking to the tree to see it and pray for blessings. The sick for healing, students for success, the poor for food, and the wealthy for more wealth. Many believe their prayers were answered due to their sincere faith. They even built a large temple to worship the magical fish, and dozens of priests stayed there, chanting and performing rituals. People traveled hundreds of miles to visit. Years later, the merchant returned and saw the temple with the enchanted fish written at the entrance. Amused, he revealed the truth to the temple attendants, that it was just an ordinary salted fish, and there were no supernatural powers involved. He took down the fish, and soon after, people stopped visiting. Eventually, the temple fell into ruin. 18. Going with the flow. A saint once visited a waterfall that was about 200 feet high with such a powerful flow that no fish could survive there. However, he spotted an old man walking into the waterfall. Thinking the old man was in danger and disregarding his own safety, the saint sent a disciple to follow the river and rescue him. Surprisingly, they found the old man more than a hundred steps away, walking and singing with his silver hair fluttering in the wind. The saint hurried after the old man, and when he caught up, he asked, Sir, I thought you were a deity, but now I see you are human. Can you tell me how you managed to walk through such a fierce current? The old man calmly replied, There's nothing special about it. I didn't use any special methods. I just entered with the swirl of the current and came out with it. I simply make myself go along with the flow instead of letting it sweep me away, which allows me to handle it easily. 19. Typical Values Once while digging in the soil, a man accidentally found an exquisite sculpture from the Lai dynasty. He sold it to an art collector who specializes in ancient pieces. The collector paid a high price for it, and the man left happily with his earnings. As he walked home, he thought to himself, With this money, my life will be more comfortable and happier from now on. That stone statue was just an inanimate object buried in the ground for so long. How could it fetch such a high price? Meanwhile, the collector admired the newly acquired sculpture and thought, This sculpture is carved so vividly, the artist must have been incredibly skilled. It truly is a masterpiece that has just awakened after a thousand years of sleep underground. Why would someone not appreciate such a precious piece of art and instead settle for those tasteless coins. 20. Full and not yet full. There was a young man who had been an apprentice to a master for many years. He felt that he had learned all there was to learn from his mentor and proudly declared, I have mastered all of your techniques and am now ready to practice on my own. Observing his apprentice's self-satisfied manner, the master asked, What do you mean by having learned everything? I've learned enough. There's no room for more, the young man replied. Fill this bowl with rocks, the master instructed. The apprentice did as he was told. Is it full? the master asked. Yes, it's full, the apprentice answered. The master then scooped up a handful of sand and poured it into the bowl. None spilled over. Is it full now? he asked again. Now it is full, the apprentice admitted. The master then poured a glass of water into the bowl without spilling any. Is it full now? he asked once more. The apprentice, feeling embarrassed, hung his head. From this story, we are reminded of the deeper meaning of the phrase, learning has no limits. Young people often think that, having read many books, they have grasped all knowledge, but this is like the bowl filled with rocks. 21. The Necktie A guy was crossing the desert, and after half a day without a drop of water, he was extremely thirsty. 
As he was about to leave the desert, he encountered a man offering to sell him a necktie. He responded, You're selling this and I'm here nearly going blind from thirst. It's so hot I feel like tearing off my clothes and you're trying to sell me a necktie? Annoyed, the seller moved on. Finally, the man found a small bar in a town next to the desert and rushed in, eagerly asking the waiter at the door, Please give me a glass of water. His throat was almost cracking from dryness, but then he heard the waiter reply, Sorry, sir, no tie, no entry. The waiter politely refused his request. What? 22. Footprints in the Mud When monk Jiam Chan first became a monk, the head of the monastery noticed his intelligent and hard-working nature and secretly praised him. However, he assigned him to be the walking monk, a role no one else in the monastery wanted. Daily, he went out in rain and wind, enduring hardship. People often looked down on him, mocking and ridiculing him. This made Jiam Chan very angry. One night, around three in the morning, Jiam Chan was still awake. The head monk found this unusual, so he went into Jiam Chan's room and saw him lying still with a pile of worn-out straw sandals beside his bed. He woke Jiam Chan and asked, Why didn't you go out for alms today? And why are these broken sandals here? Jiam Chan yawned and said, Others wear a pair of straw sandals for a year without problems, but in just over a year, I've worn out so many. Should I try to save sandals for the monastery? Understanding the situation, the head monk smiled and said, Last night it rained heavily. Let's go check out the road in front of the monastery together. They went to the muddy road in front of the monastery. The head monk lightly tapped Jiam Chan's shoulder and asked, Do you want to be an ordinary monk or a master of Buddhist teachings? Jiam Chan replied, Of course, I want to be a renowned master, but right now, as a monk who begs for alms and is despised by others, how can I master the teachings? The head monk smiled and asked, Did you walk on this road yesterday? Yam Chan answered, Yes. The head monk then asked, Can you find your footprints from yesterday? Jiam Chan didn't understand and said, The road was hard and flat yesterday. How could I find my footprints? The head monk smiled and said, Let's walk on this road again today. Can you find your footprints now? Jiam Chan said, Of course. The head monk smiled, patted Jiam Chan's shoulder, and explained, It's only on a muddy road that footprints remain. Many people in the world live ordinary lives without facing storms and difficulties, just like feet walking on a hard, flat road that leave no trace. But those who walk through storms and hardships, like feet on a muddy road, leave deep and lasting marks. The further they go, the more their footprints validate their worth. Ashamed, Jiam Chan bowed his head. From then on, his vigorous steps left deep marks on the muddy road in front of the monastery, leaving a trail across the land. Only in muddy conditions does life leave deep and significant marks. 23. Giving Way there was a young scholar about to cross a narrow wooden bridge when he saw a pregnant woman approaching from the opposite direction. Since the bridge was too narrow, he stepped back to let her pass first. After she crossed, he started walking again, but halfway across, he encountered a woodcutter returning from the forest. Without a word, the scholar quietly turned around and let the woodcutter pass. The third time, he didn't dare to go onto the bridge again until everyone else had crossed and he was alone. Just as he was about to reach the other side, a farmer with a cart started up the bridge. This time, the scholar didn't want to turn back. He took off his hat and respectfully asked the farmer, Excuse me, sir, I'm almost at the end of the bridge. Could you please let me pass before you? The farmer disagreed and glared at the scholar, saying, don't you see I'm pushing a cart? So they began to argue loudly, unwilling to give way to each other. At that moment, a boat with an old monk approached under the bridge. The two men asked him to mediate. After hearing the story, 
The monk clasped his hands, chanted a blessing, and asked the farmer, Are you in a hurry to get somewhere? The farmer replied, Yes, it's getting dark, and I still haven't reached the market. The monk said, If you're in such a hurry, why waste time arguing? Just a few steps back, and this gentleman can cross. Then you can quickly continue to the market. Hearing this, the farmer said nothing more. The monk then smiled at the scholar and asked, Why not let this farmer pass, especially since you're just a few steps from crossing? The scholar replied, Before this man, I had already stepped aside for many others. If I keep doing this, I don't know when I'll ever cross. The monk responded, But you still haven't crossed yet. You've already let many others go ahead of you. Why not add one more? It shows your character. Why not do it? Hearing this, the scholar felt ashamed. 24. The Clam and the Stork, a win for the fishermen. By the riverbank, a large clam had opened its shell to relax and bask in the sunshine. A stork spotted this, pecked at the clam's flesh, but the clam quickly snapped its shell shut, trapping the stork's beak. The stork struggled but couldn't free itself. If it doesn't rain today or tomorrow, you'll die of thirst, the trapped stork mumbled unclearly. The clam responded, If I don't let you go today or tomorrow, you'll starve. Both stared defiantly at each other, neither willing to give in. Eventually, a fisherman came by and caught them both. 25. Who forgives whom? Once a man wanted to humiliate Buddha Siddhartha by seeing how he would react. He spat on Buddha's face. Buddha calmly wiped his face and asked, Is there anything else you would like to say? This reaction surprised the man and left him unsure how to respond, so he walked away. That night he couldn't sleep at all, troubled by his actions and feeling guilty. The next morning he returned and knelt before Buddha, pleading, Please forgive me. Buddha replied, Who is there to forgive you now? The person who was spat upon no longer exists, and the one who spat does not exist anymore either. There's no need for apologies. Forget about it. There's nothing that needs to be done. Those two people are gone. There's no one left, and there's nothing left to do. You are a new person, and I am a new person. Everything is constantly changing and moving. Nothing remains fixed. By holding on to this, you make a mistake. 26. The Leopard, the Python, and the Gazelle, a tale of conflict and consequence. In a certain forest, there was a large python and a leopard both stalking a gazelle. The leopard watched the python, and the python watched the leopard, each silently plotting their next move. The leopard thought, if I want to eat the gazelle, I must first eliminate the python. The python thought similarly, to get the gazelle, I first have to take out the leopard. Therefore, the leopard and the python attacked each other. The leopard bit the python's neck, thinking, if I don't kill it, it will strangle me. The python wrapped around the leopard, thinking, if I don't strangle it, it will eat me. So both fought fiercely. Meanwhile, the gazelle casually strolled away, and both the leopard and python fell to the ground exhausted. A hunter who witnessed the battle commented, if both had simultaneously attacked the prey and then calmly shared it, neither would have died. If both had left the prey alone, neither would have died. If one had left, the other could have easily hunted the prey without dying. If both had understood the gravity of the situation, neither had to die. Their deaths were caused by a lack of humility and turning the hunt into a survival battle. 27. The Statue There once was a handsome prince with a regal bearing, but he had a hunched back. Despite consulting many doctors, his condition did not improve. This made the prince feel very self-conscious, and he never dared to show himself in front of his courtiers. Seeing his son's distress, the king, deeply concerned, sought advice from the wisest person in the kingdom. This advisor suggested a unique solution. Upon returning home, 
The king gathered all the sculptors in the country and commissioned a statue of the prince. Unlike the real prince, the statue stood tall and straight, exuding confidence and a noble air that impressed all who saw it. The king placed this statue in front of the prince's residence. When the prince saw it, he was deeply moved, his heart filled with warmth and happiness, and he was brought to tears. The king told him, If you work hard and practice, you can be just like this. Motivated by the statue, the prince started to pay more attention to keeping his back straight. A few months later, people began to notice an improvement in his posture. Encouraged by their comments, the prince became even more diligent. Gradually, a miracle occurred. His back straightened, much like the statues. 28. A Miraculous Prescription for Hope A blind musician stumbled along playing his instrument to make a living. He carried with him a special prescription that, according to an experienced practitioner, could restore his sight if he broke 1,000 strings while playing his instrument. He could not miss even one string. After 53 years, the musician finally broke the thousandth string. He handed the prescription to a man with good eyesight. The man looked at it and said, This is just a blank piece of paper with nothing written on it. The musician, with tears in his eyes, suddenly understood the deeper meaning behind the 1,000 strings given by the wise man. It was about hope and perseverance. Holding the prescription, he passed it to another blind musician, telling him, Here is a prescription that can cure your eyes, but you must break 1,000 strings to open this paper. The other musician joyfully accepted the miraculous prescription. 29. Half a Carpet There was a man who, after getting married, had a son. He loved his son dearly, but despised his own father. His father was unsteady and slow, always seeming to be in the way. He didn't do much besides eat and smoke. Because of this, the man wanted to send his father away. One day, he told his wife, let's have the old man live outside. His wife begged him to reconsider, but he wouldn't listen. With no other choice, she said, then at least let him take a carpet with him. The man secretly wanted to give only half a carpet. But out loud, he agreed, Fine, give him a carpet. At that moment, their son spoke up, Dad, don't give Grandpa a whole carpet. Just give him half and keep the other half safe for when I grow up. When I'm older, you'll need it when you have to live outside like Grandpa. The son's words frightened the man into changing his mind. He kept his father at home, realizing that his actions might one day be mirrored by his son. 30. Heaven and Hell A man was given a tour of heaven and hell. When he arrived in hell, a place where demons are confined, he was shocked by what he saw. There was a lavish meal laid out before everyone, but there was no music or laughter. Despite sitting at a banquet table, everyone looked gloomy and joyless. He noticed that on their left side they had a fork tied, and on their right a knife, both four feet long making it impossible to cut or pick up food. As a result, they were all starving. Then he went up to heaven, where the scene was much like in hell, with similarly long knives and forks. However, the residents of heaven were constantly singing and laughing. At first he was puzzled, but then he understood the reason. In hell, everyone only thought of themselves and shared with no one, which left them all starving. In contrast, the people in heaven helped each other, with one person feeding another. Thus, no one went hungry. This showed that by helping others, they were also helping themselves. 31. Possession and Release A fisherman once caught a sea turtle and brought it home to care for it like his own child. However, the turtle wouldn't eat, drink, or move, and it spent its days lying there crying. My heart is out in the great ocean, where my home is, my children, and my joy. Please let me go, the turtle pleaded with the fisherman. The fisherman didn't want to let it go because he had grown fond of it. 
Over time, seeing the beloved turtle grow weaker, the fisherman's heart cooled, and he decided to release it back to the sea. One day, suddenly, he heard a knock at the door, and upon opening it, he found the turtle he had released the previous year. You found happiness already. Why have you come back? My happiness is because of you. I can't forget you, the turtle replied. Well, go on then. As long as you're happy, that's enough. Don't come back to visit anymore, the fisherman said compassionately. The turtle left reluctantly, but a month later, it returned. Oh, what does this mean? When I wanted to keep you forever, I tried everything and couldn't move you. And now that I've let you go, you come back, the fisherman said. 32. The Mysterious Door There was an official who was not only more talented than most, but also an exceptional diplomat, deeply trusted by the king. After his death, finding someone to replace him was no easy task. The king searched throughout the kingdom and finally narrowed it down to three candidates. One was a great mathematician who could solve any mathematical problem. Mathematics requires absolute precision and forms the basis of all other sciences. Another was a philosopher and a master magician who could think up anything without any help, and he was also a writer who created worlds with his words and imagination. The third was a priest who had complete faith in God and prayed daily. The king gave these three candidates three days to prepare for a contest to determine who would become his chief advisor. During these three days, the mathematician worked nonstop, without eating or sleeping, knowing that his future could be prosperous and happy. The philosopher prepared for every possible scenario to make sure he was ready for the test. The priest, however, ate well and rested, spending his days in prayer and leisurely walks, as he believed life itself was a continuous test, and he needed no special preparation. On the day of the contest, the mathematician was exhausted from his intense preparation, barely able to stand while the philosopher was overwhelmed by his thoughts. In contrast, the priest arrived cheerful, humming tunes and enjoying the beauty of nature, unburdened by desires or expectations. The king had prepared a test involving a door with a lock that displayed numbers but had no key. The numbers were supposed to unlock the door, and the first to exit the room would win. The mathematician immediately started calculating and listing possibilities, intensely focused on the numbers. The philosopher blindfolded himself and used his unique methods to tackle the puzzle one after the other. Meanwhile, the priest, knowing nothing of mathematics or science, simply sat in a corner, sang, and prayed. When the others remembered the priest, they found he had already left the room and the door was open. The king then entered and announced that the contest had ended long ago, with the priest having already won. Puzzled, they asked how he did it. The priest explained that while sitting and praying, a voice in his head reminded him to check the door, which, to his surprise, was unlocked. So, he simply opened it and walked out. 33. The Seed Long ago, in a certain country, there was a wise and kind king who was greatly respected by everyone. The king was getting old, but he had not yet chosen a successor, which worried him a lot. One day he said to his ministers, I will choose a child from the kingdom who is honest to be my adopted child. He then had the ministers gather all the children in the kingdom and gave each one a flower seed. He instructed them, Whoever can take care of these seeds and grow beautiful flowers will be my successor to the throne. The children took their seeds and planted them. They watered, fertilized, and weeded diligently. Among them, one child took very good care of their seed. But despite changing the soil and caring for it daily, the seed did not sprout. As the day to present the flowers to the king approached, the seed still lay dormant. The king visited each child to see their flowers smiling contentedly. When he reached the child holding a pot of soil, he noticed tears on the child's face. The king asked, Why have you brought just a pot of soil? 
The child explained how they had cared for the seed and changed the soil, but it never sprouted. The child also confessed to having once stolen apples from someone's garden, thinking this might be why the seed did not grow. Hearing this, the king was overjoyed and took the child's hand, saying, You are very honest, and you are the one I have been looking for. The others were surprised and asked, Why have you chosen this child with only a pot of soil as your successor? The king smiled and revealed, The seeds I gave to all the children had been boiled and were incapable of growing. None of them could have sprouted. Hearing this, the children holding beautiful flower pots bowed their heads in shame. 34. The Thief and Enlightenment One day, a famous master's temple was broken into by a thief. When the thief met the master, he asked, Can I still achieve enlightenment? But first, he explained something to the master. I am a thief and I can't quit. So please don't ask me to stop stealing. It's impossible. I've tried to give it up many times, but all attempts have been useless, and I don't want to waste more time on something I can't do. Stealing is my life. It's who I am, and I must accept that fate. Other than that, I will follow anything else you say. Why worry about being a thief? The master asked. Has anyone discussed this matter with you before? The thief replied, Whenever I visited temples and met monks, they told me to quit stealing. The master laughed and said, Perhaps you came here to steal, and that's why they care about you being a thief, but I don't mind. The thief was delighted and said, Master, you are so wise, now I can be your disciple. The master accepted him, saying, You can go and do whatever you like, but there's one condition. You must achieve full enlightenment. You can enter any house, take whatever you want. Those things are yours. What you do doesn't concern me, but you must achieve enlightenment. The thief didn't realize the trick and continued, That sounds great. I'll try it. Three weeks later, the thief returned and said to the master, If I achieve enlightenment, I won't be able to steal anymore. And if I steal, enlightenment will disappear, and I'll be in trouble. The master calmly replied, I'm not concerned with that. Don't mention being a thief or stealing again. Now you decide. If you want enlightenment, you must be determined. If not, make your final decision. The thief was in agony. It's hard to decide now. I've seen it. It's beautiful. No matter what you say, I can't give it up. After some thought, he continued, One evening during my first break-in at the palace, I opened all the treasure chests. I could have become the wealthiest man, but I always tried to maintain enlightenment. When I was enlightened, desires disappeared, and the jewels before me seemed no different than ordinary stones. When I lost enlightenment, the treasures appeared again. So many times I even stopped caring about them, as they were just rocks. And why should I lose myself over a rock? Finally, I decided they are worthless. 35. The Monkey an elderly man who appeared like a wise sage entered a small village at the foot of the Himalayas. He announced to all the villagers that he knew a magical spell to turn stones into gold. However, he stated that nothing in this world is free. Anyone who wanted to learn this magic must first pay with their most valuable possession as tuition. The villagers, always eager to strike it rich but very poor, gathered to discuss this. They agreed that sacrificing a little to learn the magic was a reasonable exchange, so they collected money and gave it to the old man as tuition, listening intently as he taught the miraculous spell. The old man swallowed loudly and chanted a series of magical words, then turned a stone in a wooden barrel into a shimmering piece of gold. Teach us now, everyone demanded. The old man didn't hesitate to teach them the magical chant, making sure even the simplest villager could recite it by heart. He was satisfied and told them that they could start using the spell the next morning at sunrise. He assured everyone that they could turn worthless stones into bright gold, but he had one condition. 
They must not think of the monkey from the Himalayas while chanting. Absolutely not, the villagers repeated skeptically. What does gold have to do with a monkey from the Himalayas? The old man was surely being nonsensical, they thought, as they had never even considered the Himalayan monkey before. Why should they think about it now? But a thousand years later it is said that if you visit that village, you will see quite a few people putting stones in a wooden barrel and muttering the chant, trying hard not to think of the Himalayan monkey. They never managed to produce gold, but no one blames the old man for lying, because the more they try not to think about the monkey, the more they end up thinking about it. 36. Three Sincere Pieces of Advice On his way back from a nearby village, a priest saw someone selling a beautiful bird. He bought the bird thinking, such a beautiful bird must taste delicious. Suddenly the bird spoke up, you shouldn't think like that. Shocked, the priest asked, What? Did you just speak? The bird replied, Yes, I am no ordinary bird. If you let me go, I'll give you three pieces of advice. Intrigued by the talking bird, which he assumed must be wise, the priest agreed, All right, tell me the three pieces of advice and I will set you free. The bird advised, First, never trust lies, no matter who says them, even if they are powerful or famous. If they're wrong, don't believe them. The priest nodded in agreement. Second, the bird continued, never do something beyond your abilities, no matter how necessary it might seem. Always assess your capabilities carefully. Smart people know their limits, while fools try to show they are more capable than they really are. The priest nodded again. Third, if you do something right, there's no need for regret. People only regret when they do something wrong. The priest found all three pieces of advice profound and perfect. He released the bird and happily returned to his church, thinking about using these teachings in his next sermon and even engraving them on the walls and furniture to always remember them. Suddenly he heard the bird laughing in a tree. When asked why, the bird said, You are foolish. I had a very valuable diamond inside me. If you had killed me, you would have been rich. Regretting his actions, the priest angrily threw his notebook and tried to climb the tree. Despite being old and never having climbed before, he attempted to reach the bird. Each time he got close, the bird flew higher until both were at the very top. When he reached out to grab the bird, he slipped and fell, severely injuring himself. As he lay dying, the bird landed on a low branch and said, You really are foolish. First, did you actually believe I had a diamond inside me? That was a lie. Then, you did something beyond your ability. You know birds can fly, so why did you think you could catch me? And now, do you regret letting me go? You did something good. Why feel remorse? Go home, write these rules down, and use them in your next sermon. 37. Why I had to shake his hand. This morning, while shaving and looking in the mirror, something felt off. The reflection showed a pale face with wrinkled eyes that seemed to be smiling falsely, as if trying to flatter someone else. Yesterday, at the lab's entrance, I ran into a young professor, a man of significant influence. He had risen quickly through the ranks, not because of remarkable talent, but by adapting to the times. He had just defended his thesis and was working on his dissertation. His skill at ingratiating himself and his psychophantic prowess were astonishing to colleagues. We didn't like each other much, only nodding when we met at the door, maintaining an unfriendly air. However, upon seeing me, his face lit up with a feigned enthusiasm and warmth, as if our chance meeting was a delight to him. He then grabbed my hand tightly and said, It's so great to see you. I had the honor of reading your paper on Antarctica the other day. It was top-notch. It's a shame we aren't working together on this. I knew he was making it up as my work had nothing to do with his. I wanted to respond coolly with a simple thanks. Instead, I found myself smiling back, feigning surprise and politely saying, 
I heard you're working on your dissertation. Don't waste that time. I really admire your dedication, Professor. And continued to shake his hand vigorously, almost painfully. I don't know why I acted like this, parroting insincere compliments and smiling broadly. Even my facial muscles felt the strain. After the psychophantic smile and the overly friendly handshake, which felt like a mockery, I was disturbed all day. I gritted my teeth and cursed myself, despising this me I had become. What was this? Self-defense, clear-sightedness, or just a servile nature? This young professor wasn't as talented or profound as me. His position depended on our lab, and I really didn't need anything from him. So why did I enthusiastically shake his hand and utter empty, flattering words? This morning, as I shaved, I looked at my familiar yet detestable face in the mirror. It was deceitful, psychophantic, cowardly. At life's crossroads, everyone seeks to protect themselves, almost wanting to split their lives in two. Then, looking back, I suddenly felt foolish. 38. Snail Scramble A group of small animals, including a white rabbit, a turtle, a snail, and others, gathered to visit the flower garden in front. A frog with a large neck loudly declared, Let's go! So, they all set off together. As the frog hopped along, it cheered, Keep going! Keep going! The white rabbit smiled and dashed ahead. The turtle struggled to climb, and the ant ran as fast as it could. Suddenly, a voice from behind called out, Oh, you all are crazy! Where are you running to? Everyone turned in surprise to see the snail shouting while heading in a different direction. Snail, you're going the wrong way! The frog yelled, follow us. Where are you going? Asked the snail, looking at the others and saying, Are you all blind? You need to follow me. Despite what anyone said, the snail refused to listen and kept crawling in its own direction. Everyone else sighed and went their separate ways. The snail muttered to itself as it foamed, My eyes are always on the garden. I can't possibly be wrong. If you won't listen, then stay away from me. Leave me alone. It doesn't matter. Their legs aren't as many as mine. But the faster they run, the further away they get from where they need to be. 39. The Light of Dawn A teacher said to his students, Do you know when the night ends and the day begins? The students replied, When people can distinguish between a goat and a dog in the distant herd, that means the day has arrived. No, the teacher corrected. Then what is the right answer? The students asked. The teacher explained, It is when we can see each other's faces clearly, meaning when you can still recognize your brothers and sisters. Because if you cannot see these things, no matter what time it is, it is still night. 40. The Fisherman and the Gemstones Before dawn, an old fisherman went to the river to start his day's work. Suddenly, something caught on his leg. It turned out to be a bag of stones. He picked it up, set his net aside, and sat by the riverbank waiting for daylight. With nothing else to do and feeling quite bored, he took a stone from the bag and threw it into the river with a splash. He continued to throw each stone one by one. As the sun began to rise, he realized he had thrown all but one stone. In the sunlight, he shouted in shock when he discovered the stone in his hand was a precious gem. He couldn't believe he had thrown away a bag full of gems. He had lost a fortune in a moment. Full of regret, he cursed himself and cried bitterly as if he had lost his mind. The fisherman had accidentally found a fortune, but also accidentally lost it. However, he was still lucky the sun had risen before he threw the last gem away. In life, how many of us have wasted opportunities like the old fisherman? In the darkness, before the sun rises, we often waste the gems of our lives. Life is a treasure trove of gems, yet we often don't know how to use it and end up wasting it. By the time we realize their value, it's often too late. When the secrets, joy, liberation, compassion, and wisdom are all lost, a lifetime has also passed. 41. 
the secret. There was an old man who sold fish, and his business was doing really well. Many people liked to buy his fish, saying it was the best quality and tasted the best. The other fish sellers couldn't figure out why, because they all fished in the same spot and even used the same water to keep their fish. Despite the fish and water being the same, customers still said his fish were of better quality and tasted better. One day, when the fishermen went on a trip, the other sellers decided to check his fish container to find out his secret. They were surprised to see that it was just like theirs, but inside there was a big, aggressive fish splashing around. After some thinking, they realized the answer. The large fish kept moving, not letting the other fish rest, forcing them to swim continuously, which naturally improved the quality of their meat. 42. Retreat and Attack Once a wolf encountered a goat on the road. The wolf said, I want to eat you. The goat replied, Dear wolf, you want to eat me, and I am flattered. However, my meat isn't as tender and delicious as other goats. My body is very strong. I can even defeat a bull. If you don't believe me, I can show you. Doubtful, the wolf found a very strong bull. He locked the goat and the bull in a room to fight. To the wolf's surprise, the survivor who walked out was not the strong bull but the supposedly weak goat. The bull was lying motionless on the floor, with its horns broken and blood streaming from its head. The wolf hurriedly asked what happened. The bull explained, That goat was very agile. Every time I charged, I missed and hit the wall instead causing me great pain and my head to bleed. The more angry I got, the harder I charged, and the more pain and exhaustion I felt. Meanwhile, the goat got even quicker and trickier. In my anger, I exposed a weakness, and the goat seized the opportunity to defeat me. The wolf exclaimed, Oh, that goat is indeed cunning. It skillfully dodged to find an opening to strike. I'll catch it soon. But when the wolf went out to look for the goat, it was nowhere to be found. Sometimes in life, retreating is also an effective way to attack. 43. The Religious Leader A well-respected religious leader was earnestly praying in a flower garden. At that time, a distraught woman, in a panic, was frantically searching for her lost child. In her hurry, she didn't notice the religious leader kneeling in prayer and accidentally bumped into him, but she didn't even stop to apologize and hurried away. The religious leader was visibly annoyed and felt angry as he continued praying. When he finished, the woman had found her child and happily ran back. Seeing the religious leader's angry face, she was shocked and alarmed. The religious leader sternly said, Can you explain your actions just now? The woman replied, I'm sorry, sir, I was so worried about my child's safety that I didn't see you there. But weren't you praying? Isn't the being you were praying to far more important than my child? Why did you even notice me? At this, the religious leader bowed his head in silence. 44. The Proud Horsekeeper when Yan Zi was the prime minister of the state of Qi, he once passed by the house of a horsekeeper. One day, the horsekeeper's wife peered through the crack of the door and saw her husband sitting on a cart looking very pleased with himself and displaying a grand demeanor. When the horsekeeper came home, he found his wife angry and demanding to return to her parents' home. Confused, he asked, Why do you want to go back to your parents' house? His wife replied, Yan Zi is the prime minister, renowned throughout the nation, Yet I've seen him bowing humbly while sitting in his carriage. But you, just a horsekeeper, act so arrogantly as if you don't know who you really are, which is why I can't live with you anymore. From that day on, the horsekeeper changed his attitude and became more humble. When Yan Zi noticed the change and asked about the reason, the horsekeeper explained the situation. Later, Yan Zi even recommended him for a significant position in the state of Qi. 45. The Magic of Life 
A wealthy young man was deeply in love with a beautiful and fashionable lady who lived a luxurious life. He adored her and always did what she asked. The day before their engagement, he asked her, What would you like as an engagement gift? She honestly replied, I want a diamond ring. So he bought her an expensive diamond ring. There was another young man who was poor but in love with an ordinary-looking girl who was frugal and hard-working. The day before their engagement, he asked her, What gift would you like? She said, I just need a crystal ring. With the little money he had, he bought her a crystal ring, and she was very happy. Twenty years later, the first couple had almost spent all their wealth and their life had become very difficult. They even sold the diamond ring, and now she wore a crystal ring. The second couple, however, had a much better life thanks to their hard work and savings. The crystal ring she once had was now replaced with a diamond ring, and they lived a fulfilled and happy life. Life is like magic. Twenty years can change everything. The actions we take today can influence our future, turning crystal into diamonds and diamonds into crystal. 46. Happiness is a glass of water. There was a poor man and a rich man debating about what happiness really is. The poor man said, happiness is the present moment. The rich man, looking disdainfully at the poor man's thatched roof and worn-out clothes, said, how can you call this happiness? My happiness comes from owning a hundred houses and having a thousand servants. A massive fire later destroyed all of the rich man's homes, burning up all his possessions and his servants all ran away. Overnight, the rich man became a beggar. In the sweltering heat of July, this beggar, sweating profusely, walked up to the poor man's humble home and asked for a sip of water. The poor man handed him a cool glass of water and asked, Now, what do you think happiness is? The beggar, with a hopeful look in his eyes, replied, Right now, it's this glass of water in my hand. Boom, 47. Following Dad. Regularly repeating an action turns it into a habit, and nurturing a habit shapes our character. There was a man who had a routine of visiting the local bar for a drink every morning before starting his work. One morning, after saying goodbye to his family, he was on his way to the bar. Not long into his walk, he felt someone was following him. Turning around, he saw his child walking in his footsteps in the snow, excitedly saying, Dad, look, I'm following in your footsteps. Hearing this made the man stop in his tracks. He thought to himself, I'm headed to the bar and my son is following me. From that day on, he never went to the bar again. 48. Threshold. In the dim fog, a building with a narrow door appeared, and outside stood a young woman. As she stood at the entrance, a chilling air flowed out from within, along with a hoarse voice that sounded almost like a moan. What brings you here? Do you know what awaits you inside? I know, the girl replied. Cold, hunger, hatred, ridicule, contempt, humiliation, prison, illness, and even death, I know. And all this from strangers, completely alone. I know. I'm prepared. I'm willing to endure all the suffering, all the torment. Not just from enemies, but your own family and friends will bring you pain. Yes, they will bring me these things, and I accept that too. All right. Are you ready for this sacrifice? I'm ready. This is a meaningless sacrifice. You will die, and perhaps no one will know or honor your memory. I don't need gratitude or pity. I don't seek fame. Are you willing to endure this? The girl bowed her head. I am willing. The voice inside paused briefly, then continued. What if you regret this later? Have you thought about wasting your youth? I've considered that too. Please just let me in. Go ahead. The girl stepped through the doorway, and immediately the curtain dropped. Fool! Someone behind jeered. A saint! A voice echoed from nowhere in particular. 49. Behind the small dot. 
A teacher marked a small white dot on the blackboard and then asked the students, What do you see? All 50 students replied in unison, A white dot. The teacher said, That's not correct. The students were puzzled and asked, Why not? It's clearly a white dot. One brave student approached the blackboard to take a closer look at the dot the teacher had made. After looking from side to side and up and down many times, they still only saw a white dot and said decisively, Sir, there can't be a mistake. It is indeed a white dot. The teacher responded, You have 50 pairs of eyes and all you see is a white dot. Another student asked, Sir, are you asking us to use our imagination? The teacher clarified, I'm not teaching literature. I asked what you actually see. The reality is a white dot. All 50 students responded together. Don't you see the blackboard behind the dot and the wall behind the blackboard? The teacher asked. Only then did the students realize their oversight. They had seen only the white dot on the board and forgotten about the blackboard and the wall behind it. Isn't this a common mistake we all make in life? We make this mistake due to habitual thinking as time passes and our vision becomes limited. Conventional thinking only allows us to see the shining star, forgetting the sky and the vast universe behind it. 50. The Voracious Barracuda There once was a giant barracuda that ruled over the ocean, so powerful that even the fiercest group of snapping turtles obeyed its commands. One day, it ordered the turtles to catch fish for it. The turtles chose the fattest fish and brought back a whole boatload for the barracuda to feast on. Yet, after eating continuously, the barracuda was still not satisfied. It created a huge wave that pushed the school of fish towards the shore and commanded the turtles, Hurry! Catch them for me! Catch! Catch! Seeing the turtles move too slowly, the barracuda took matters into its own fins. It opened its mouth wide and lunged forward to swallow the whole school of fish. But due to the powerful wave, it was thrown against a rocky shore and could not get back into the water. Stuck halfway on the rocks and half in the sea, the school of fish it had chased turned around and slowly began to nibble away at the stranded barracuda. 51. The Philosophy of Balloons One day, a group of white children were playing in a park when an old man selling balloons wheeled his cart in. The children rushed over excitedly and each bought a balloon, happily chasing it as it danced in the wind. In a corner of the park there was a black child sitting alone, feeling too shy to join the others. Only after the white children had left did he approach the old man's cart and asked earnestly, Could I buy a balloon from you? The old man looked at him kindly and replied gently, Of course. Which color would you like? Regaining his courage, the child answered, I would like a black one. Delighted, the child took the black balloon, released it and watched as it slowly rose against the backdrop of the blue sky and white clouds, creating a striking scene. The old man watched the balloon ascend and softly patted the black child's head, saying, Remember, whether a balloon rises or not isn't about its color or shape, but what it's filled with inside. A person's success isn't about their race or background, but whether they have confidence. This black child was Keen, who would go on to become a renowned psychologist in America. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.